So picking up from there, we, I asked what caused that separation, and, and someone had said, well, the, the earth started separating, and we got to the Pangea, where everything was once together, and then slowly over time began to separate. We talked about what caused that separation, and plate tectonics was what was brought up. <clears throat> plate tectonics are, how, what are explained by the Earth's core being a volcanic type environment, and as those volcanoes begin to erupt and the heat rises, it causes that land to shift. Now, is it just a small, simple shift? It's usually like a large-scale thing that causes big storms and has huge repercussions. But in the end, once everything settles, we see this slow, gradual movement away from one piece of land to multiple pieces of land, which is how we explain how organisms that are similar uh, are so far apart, so spread out, and that they have created their own species, which is another thing that we'll begin to talk about today. Another scientist you need to be familiar with is Lamarck, and he talked about evolution, but his ex explanation of why we have things and why we don't have things was atrophy. And atrophy is if you don't use it, you lose it. And we had talked about that in vestigial structures, but... What he was saying was, well, if, if you don't use it or if you use something, then you'll see that that'll show up in, in future generations. Now, did he know anything about DNA or anything in genetics? The answer is no. So he was kind of right, but his mechanism for explaining it was wrong. Like if you don't have a muscle or if you don't use a muscle, it disappears. That's not what happens. Like it doesn't just disappear because you don't, don't, don't use it eventually you mutate to a point where it's no longer needed and then that muscle is not there. So he had a good thought process. He just didn't understand what was actually used. And it, and it wasn't just if you don't use it, you lose it. That there, was, there is some genetics mixed in there. Like he said, for example, the reason why these birds got long legs is because they were in, sh in water and their bellies were touching the water so they would stretch their legs. And because they stretched their legs... When they had kids, their kids were born with stretched legs. And that's not a thing. Just because you work out, does that mean that when you have kids, they'll work out? No, it doesn't. The reason why these birds got longer legs is because randomly, one of them mutated genetically and had longer legs, and they survived long enough to do what? Reproduce. So it wasn't just that they were stretching. We see this gentleman also say that the reason why giraffes have long, le or long necks is because they were stretching, and that's just not the case. He had a good idea, but the mechanism that he used to explain it was, was uh, faulty. So the changes in the earth over time, we have two different principles that you and I will be looking at. Gradualism. Gradualism says that things just generally change gradually over long periods of time. Um, and I feel like that's probably the most easily paralleled with where we are right now. Things just gradually change. Then there's uniformitarianism, which says that things change in a very uniformed, planned out way. I get that thought process, and it sounds really good on paper, but in practice, there's definitely some flaws for that. So these two are the two processes that we use to explain changes over time, okay? Um, so gradualism and uniformitarianism, just making sure that you understand that they both explain how changes occurred over time. One of them's more general, and one of them's a little bit more specific. Then there's a long excerpt on Darwin's jury across the world, and we've, we already talked about, I believe, the fact that he was married and had kids. We did all that, right, last week? We said, okay, perfect. So he goes off on this journey, and he's sailing around these islands, and he's super excited when they stop because he gets to begin to collect data. And this kind of gives you some uh, general takeaways from his research. But as he continues to circle these Galapagos islands that have separated from the mainland, he observed that there were fossils. He was finding fossils. And what are fossils? Again, they're preserved remains of things that used to be. But he found fossils that really looked like organisms that were still alive today. And so he was like, okay, they're not exact, but they had a lot of similarities. So what did that, what did that lead him to think? 
We have fossils that look this way, and we have a living organism today that looks similar but is slightly different. What may have happened? It may have changed, and what would have been the main factor steering its change? Natural selection, but lead, led by the environment. In the environment, you have two choices. You can either survive or die. So you adapt or die. Okay? He said that these organisms that are, were near each other were similar, but they were different. What would cause them to interact differently, although they looked very similar? Their environment. The answer all the time is going to be their environment. And I'm going to show you some examples. And it said, and we explained that over time, if you separate one species, you separate members of those species long enough, eventually they will become different. And by eventually, I mean like over hundreds and hundreds of years, not by like 10 years. Okay? So this kind of maps out his journey. And that's what this is here for. This is also in your text. And uh, the two organisms that Darwin really provided a whole bunch of research on were the tortoises, which a lot of people aren't familiar with, and then, of course, the Galapagos finches, which are what he's famous for. But he also collected a lot of different species of plants. And what he noticed is that on the mainland, there was a certain species, but the islands also had organisms that were similar, yet had very different traits. And they were similar because they shared a common ancestor. But is the habitat or environment on this island guaranteed to be identical to this island? And we, we saw that. We saw that things changed. And then the next question was, well, how did they go from here to here? And there's the explanation of, well, once it was all together and it kind of separated, or there are quite a few hypotheses that include large storms, like hurricanes, that swept across the land and these organisms got caught up in the hurricanes and were dropped off near these other islands, but that's how they got separated. And once they're on these new islands, they either adapt or they die. And the majority of them did what, though? Mo majority of them die. Majority of them die, and we have data that backs that up. So here's some examples of these finches, Darwin's finches. And the way that he studied these, in all honesty, I don't know if you remember, if I told you he went to medical school, he would catch them and kill them and then stuff them. So he, like, kept all these preserved remains so that he could study their morphology. And remember, morphology is their physical characteristics. But he said, we have this finch that has this tiny, strong beak. We have this one that has this much wider, pointed beak. They all had different shaped beaks. But why? Their environment was different, and as a result of their environment different, they had different food sources. So you had some uh, birds that would eat just insects because that was their food source on that island. And if they didn't know how to eat insects or couldn't eat insects, then they died. So the ones that had the beaks that could eat the insects would survive long enough to do what? Reproduce. So over years, we would see that all the birds over here would have beaks that were accommodated or have evolved to eat insects. And those that lived in a terrain where they had to crack open seeds had beaks that were stronger. But if we took one of these weak beaked birds and put them on this island over here that had a much more rough terrain, guess what would happen? He would die. Like, they were just adapted over time to their environment, to their food source. But they had similar characteristics because they shared a common ancestor. Yes. <clears throat> Darwin tried to explain how he, remember, he did not know about DNA, and nobody did at this time. But he was like, how is it that we start to see these characteristics? And he proposed artificial selection, which you and I actually study today. Artificial selection says that you breed with who you want to breed with because you want the characteristics that that organism has. We do this with animals. If you want a Clydesdale horse, a purebred Clydesdale horse, you breed a female mare with a male stallion of the same species. That's artificial selection. If we let those two out in the wild, could we guarantee that they would meet each other? No, we couldn't. And we couldn't guarantee that if they did meet, that they would actually reproduce. And so now we even do artificial insemination. Like, you might not even like each other, but y'all are going to have babies. Okay? And humans have a huge role in this. But ultimately, is it natural? Is artificial selection a natural occurrence? No. No. 
we let organisms, especially out in the wild, choose their mates. Now, in 1406, we talked about the importance of natural selection. And natural selection, overall, you have two choices. You are either selected for or selected against. If you are selected for, what does that mean? You survive long enough to reproduce. That means whatever characteristics, and when I say characteristics, I'm definitely referring to your genetics. And when I'm talking about genetics, I'm talking about what molecule? DNA. Okay, and if you didn't learn that in 06, remember that DNA is genes, genetics, genome, molecular data, all of that is DNA when you see all those words in your test questions. So natural selection says that if the, your characteristics, if your DNA is beneficial, you're, you will survive long enough to, be, to reproduce. We call that being selected for. If you die before you reproduce, we say that you've been selected against. Okay, so what type of things allow you to survive long enough? Well, that you are capable of surviving in that environment. And if the environment changes, you have two choices. You can adapt or die. If you die, that means that the characteristics or the genetic material that you have aren't suitable for that environment. So should you stay? No, because if you reproduce, you're going to make kids that are also weak. So you've been selected against. So we see that these organisms adapt. And those that adapt have characteristics that are beneficial for that environment. Real quick, just because you're beneficial today, does it mean in 10 years you're still going to be beneficial? No, because what could change? The environment, and that's always going to be the answer. So we tend to see this shift, this shift where we had one species, and over time we start to see changes. And these changes were led up by random mutations that eventually led to adaptations and over time to evolution. But here is what I was talking about just a moment ago. The majority of these organisms that were given the opportunity could not adapt, so they died. They became extinct. They couldn't survive in those environments. So the, the, the fact that we have organisms that are still alive in all of these changing conditions speaks to the, the level or the strength or the robust nature of their genetic material. Micro versus macro evolution. I feel like just the term alone tells you what it is. Ma micro is evolution that occurs within a population. Okay? So, like, say that we're a population and we have... One of us has a random mutation and it's a beneficial mutation. And eventually, as we reproduce within our very small population, we start to see that show up more and more. That's micro evolution within that population. Like, for example, in those finches, how their beaks changed. Only on that island, though, within that population. That's microevolution. Versus macroevolution. And macro is a whole large change that's brought about by a lot of smaller changes. <clears throat> And this is not in just a population, but macro is in an entire species. So remember, a population is just a group of the same species in a certain location. Like in Lancaster, Texas, or Waxahachie, Texas, that's a certain location. But when we say the whole species, we're talking about the whole human species. So micro versus macro evolution. Both of them, regardless, take a long time. One is more focused on a population, the other with an entire species. Here is an example. What we see happening now are these insects that are resistant to pesticides. Our, when we initially started using, and I don't know that this is the pesticide that's used in this one, but we'll say it's DDT. Yeah, it is. It usually, DDT which is a, an insecticide that's supposed to kill all the insects or potential predators of our crops because they are a threat to the integrity of our crop. When we initially started using this pesticide, it killed all the insects. It killed all the insects. But then we have this little one right here in blue. What is that supposed to represent? He, he was resistant. And did he plan on being resistant? No. Did his parents just wish for that while they were pregnant? No. It was just a random mutation. And guess what? It allowed him to survive long enough to 
reproduce. So what do we see in future generations? Are they all completely resistant? No. But we do start to see an increase in incidence of those that are resistant until we come into the current times where the majority of them are resistant. So this is beneficial for their population. They've adapted to their environment. But by this time, what has it done to our population? It's threatened us. So guess what we're doing? We're going to adapt to our environment. And we're going to change the pesticide to one that these aren't resistant to and hope to wipe them out again. But the fact that he had this random mutation, he survived long enough to reproduce, it became an adaptation. And over time, the whole population evolved. Can you tell me why there are some of them that are still born that are not resistant? Because the, the, the genes are still there. And can you guarantee what genes your kids are going to have? No. Some of us have kids that show up looking nothing like the two parents, but maybe like a great-grandmother down the road. Not down the road, but the line. She may live, I don't know if she lives near you. Sorry. She may. But you know what I'm talking about, behind you. She's older than you. I don't know the word I'm looking for. What scientific evidence that we ha do we have that evolution has occurred? These are the six scientific evidences that evolution has occurred. The first is natural selection, and I'm going to go into each in detail. Natural selection. Scientific evidence is brought to us by fossils. We can study biogeography. And again, this is just a list. We're going to go into each in detail. Comparative morphology. Do you remember what morphology is? Physical characteristics, right. What about embryology? We kind of got into this in lab. We're looking at embryos, and embryos are before it is a fetus. This is right after fertilization, a few days or hours, depending on your species. This is what you start to look like. And then molecular biology. What molecule am I looking at here? DNA. Get off me if you didn't know that. DNA, molecular, the molecule that we're looking at is DNA. It's always going to be DNA. So let's start with natural selection. You either adapt or die. I feel like this begins to get a little re bit redundant. And if you're selected for, you survive long enough to reproduce. And if you don't, you don't. You expire, you don't reproduce. We talk about short-term evolution, like becoming resistant to pesticides. And why do I say that short-term? Because what are we going to do? We're going to change their environment. We're going to change those environments. If, they, if that insect's still alive and we need to get rid of it, you and I will get into a lab and we'll create a situation where they will no longer survive. But what about long-term type things like having wings? The crazy thing is, is like grasshoppers, what is the purpose of their wings, those that have wings? To, to jump but high and then they can kind of fly. Now, can they fly, like, long distances? No, but do they all have wings? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, it was beneficial. And in certain habitats, in certain environments, you'll see that all the grasshoppers have wings. And do we have a lot of winged grasshoppers in this area? No, because there's not very many predators that will come after them. Although there are predators. I'm not saying there's not. There's natural predators. But natural selection is one evidence that we have of evolution. Those organisms can either adapt or die. The second evidence for evolution is the fossil record. I truly feel like at this point in life, you know that fossils show what organisms used to be like, and then we use them to compare what organisms are like now. And we can see that some that were very unsuccessful, we can make no links to. But some of them that were successful, we can see slow, gradual changes to a more successful organism that's adapted to their environment. So the fossil record gives us tons and tons of information. It also provides links between organisms. Like, for example, the Archaeoteryx is the link between what biologists believe, and geologists, and paleontologists believe is the link between birds and dinosaurs. And I don't know how many of you have seen this fossil. It's one of my favorites. I feel bad because if you start to study it, you kind of look like this guy got smashed. Like his head's here, and you see it's like this all, this is imprinted onto a rock. But what we see is the skeleton of a lizard-type organism, but we see imprints of feathers. 
So we believe that this organism was one of the first to kind of branch us from dinosaurs into birds. And if you study ornithology, which is the study of birds, they'll, there'll be a reference to um, their reptilian ancestors, if that's what you study when you grow up. Okay, so just using fossils. Microevolution, once more, microevolution occurs within a population. These small random changes are called mutations. And if those mutations are beneficial, that organism will survive long enough to reproduce and create what we call adaptations. But this is within a population. This is within a population. Can we expect a population of bugs to be resistant to DDT if they've never been exposed to it before? No. Okay. So microevolution within a population. And this is still going, this is out of your textbook, but this is penicillin. This is why penicillin is not beneficial to you and I anymore. Because what were those bacteria that we were trying to kill able to do? Adapt. They mutated. They're mutated. And some of you take penicillin now, and you have a reaction to it. And it's, it's a counter reaction. So you don't even, we rarely prescribe penicillin anymore. It's usually amoxicillin or some other synthetic version. The third evidence for evolution, evolution is historical biogeography. So we study the history of organisms and where they're located. Last week we talked about the term biogeography being bio life and geography, physical locations like on earth. So where living things are physically located. We can study the history of biogeography and say, well this organism hasn't always been here. Or this organism has been here, and we can show that it's changed over time as a result of adapting to its environment. So it goes in to explain that, and your text also offers a few ex uh, examples, but there are countless examples for this. Even those large flightless birds we looked at uh, earlier in this chapter. So some really good parallels to help drive that concept in. Comparative morphology. So we're comparing physical characteristics. These three terms we have touched on previously in lecture this semester, which was the only lecture we've had besides today. Homologous is same structure but different function. Same structure but different function. So we talked about having a bat wing and a human arm and a pig, a pig forelimb. It really, a whale flipper, all of us are homologous. Then I mentioned analogous structures. Analogous structures have the same function, but a different structure. Analogous structures have the same function, but a different structure. And I believe I use like bee wings and bird wings. Like you have, they're both used for flight, but are bee wings the same structure as bird wings? No. Analogous is same Function, different structure. Homologous is same structure, different function. And we also touched on vestigial structures. And these are remnants of structures that were once used and no longer there. Because that current species, that current organism no longer needs it. We talked about the whales having a hip bone, pelvic bone, and such. Yeah, those are homologous. That is correct. Yes, sir. And more so homologous than other organisms like a whale flipper. So here, same thing. This is a, a more detailed diagram than what I showed you the other day. So I'm not going to go into detail. But you can tell the structures that are the same. They're color-coded. And you can see just by the organism that listed below that they use those exact same structures for different functions. Okay. Analogous structures. They have this same function, but they're built differently. Okay, so this, these are referencing the forelands, two totally different organisms that people are like, oh, these are flippers and da da da. Not necessarily. Okay, and are these used for flighted wings? No. Okay, so they're they're used for the same function, but have a different structure. And here's vestigial showing you. For example, the, the baleen whale, the uh, pelvic bone, the remnants of a pelvic bone. And you can see that even in snakes, we have remnants of a pelvic bone. So showing us that it's some, not all species 
but that, and some of them at one point they were uh, te tetrapods, meaning that they had forelimbs and hind limbs, so vestigial structures. So comparative morphology. The fifth evidence is comparative embryology, where we look at the embryos of organisms and compare them. And the reality is, and if you paid attention in lab, and of course it'll be there today, but there are quite a few organisms that look almost identical to humans in the embryonic phase. So unless you're super trained, it's very difficult to distinguish between a fish embryo and a human embryo. We need a few more days of differentiation to be able to say, wait, that's not a human. That's not a human. Because we have embryos that share many characteristics, that gives us evidence of a common ancestor. Yes. So this is the picture that, um, that they provide. There's, there's far better ones. This is not my favorite. Okay. But you can see, just kind of looking systemically, you can see some definite... Um, obvious morphological similarities. Not exactly are they physiological, meaning they do the exact same thing, but you can see that early on they look very similar. The last evidence of evolution is comparative molecular biology. So bottom line, what am I doing? Comparing DNA. I am no longer looking at you physically. I am no longer looking at you embryonically. Now I'm analyzing you molecularly. And if you paid attention in 1406, you know that these two fellas molecularly are very similar, almost identical, okay? And you would also know that we are almost identical. There are only small differences that make you and I unique. The majority of our genetic material is the exact same. So when we start to compare genetic material, we can say that the closer you are related to them, the more DNA you have in common. The further related you are from them, the less DNA you have in common. So if it were me and one of my daughters and Lexus, would I be more genetically related to one of them than the other? Yes, I would have much more in common with one of my biological daughters then I went with Lexus, but Lexus isn't much different from us. So you would be able to tell, and not that we would be evolutionarily different because we're within the same generation, but you can compare that genetic material and tell the differences. It's showing here that a woolly mammoth has about 98% of the exact same genetic material as an African elephant. That they're, not, they're not the same species, but they shared a common ancestor, okay? Here's your Ice Age picture. Orthogenesis, so this is not orthon... It's not the study of birds. I'm about to say it wrong. But orthogenesis says that new species are produced with the goal to become the best. What's the problem with becoming the best? If we're talking about evolution, what's the problem with becoming the best? You may be the best for this environment right now, but if the environment changes, guess what you're no longer suited for? That environment. So you are no longer the best. So the reason we say when we talk about evolution, that it is not a goal-oriented process is because we don't know what the future is going to be like. We can't predict the future environment. We can only say this is what's working for us right now. On that note, humans did not come from chimpanzees. We just shared a common ancestor, and there's quite a bit of science behind that. But a chimpanzee did not give birth to a human. That didn't happen, and it wasn't just a random mutation. We have... We have a lot of genetic material in common with them, but we were, we were not, like, born of them. We just shared a common ancestor, okay? So bottom line, whenever it says things are related, well, we just have evidence that they share a common ancestor. That's the correct biological response, okay? You don't say they're related. They share a common ancestor, okay?
So that, any questions so far? We're going to keep going because we have other sections that we have to cover. So this is the intro. This is kind of reiterating what we've just talked about. But phenotypic variation, does anybody remember what a phenotype is? What we see physically. And the phenotype is a manifestation of the genotype. And what's the genotype? Your genes. So my phenotype, my blue eyes are a result of what? The fact that I have genes for blue eyes. Okay, so my, you can't see my DNA, but you know that I have the gene for blue eyes because you can see my phenotype. When we look at organisms and we look at their phenotype, remember early on when we started classifying organisms, we didn't know about genotypes. We talked about phenotypic plasticity. If you had to tell me what you thought that meant, what do you think that means? Phenotypic plasticity. Change within a phenotype. Like sometimes you can kind of look like this, kind of look like that. There's two ways to distinguish. Quantitative and qualitative variation of phenotypes. Quantitative and qualitative variation of phenotypes. Quantitative says that it's on a range, like there's light, medium light, light light, dark light. There's a range, okay? There's no specific distinctions. That's quantitative. And I'm going to show you in just a moment a diagram. Qualitative says there's distinct groupings. There's not this range. There's clear phenotypic variation. And what we call polymorphisms. What's poly mean? Many and then morpho is the physical characteristic. So there are many distinguishable states. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. Here, this is an example of quantitative. It's a range. You, you can tell that some of them are different, but it's going to take a lot of analysis to say exactly how they're different. Okay, it's kind of like, oh. Here is qualitative. I can tell that these are clearly different from these, and these are definitely different from these. That's qualitative. There's distinct variations or polymorphisms. Is any of this analyzing genetics? No, this is all phenotypic, which is physical. Physical. Do you know where those physical variations stem from? Genes, which is what this is about to talk about. And we talk about genetic variations. Where are we going to get our genetic variation from? And we studied this in 1406. Two places. Mutations, a random change. Where, when does crossing over occur? What am I making? What type of cells? Gametes. When you're making sperm and egg. Sperm and egg are random. I mean, they're not random themselves, but their contents is random as far as genes. So we can either have the only two places for randomness in biology are mutations and in the formation of gametes, like crossing over. Now, this last section is how do we know evolution does not occur? And I'm going to tell you, first of all, we're about to disprove every aspect of this, okay? But Hardy Weinberg created, they wanted to put their hands on and say, this is what evolution looks like, and we can predict evolution. And they failed miserably. So instead of admitting failure, they said, well, if you fit into this model then you don't evolve. So I need you to, first of all, we're going to talk about Hardy-Weinberg, but I need you to understand that Hardy-Weinberg shows, if, if you meet all the criteria, that you do not evolve. So if you meet Hardy-Weinberg criteria, that population is not evolving. If you meet Hardy-Weinberg criteria, that population is not evolving. Okay? So instead of trying to say, this is how it occurred, he failed, so, well, they failed, and so now this is how we prove that heart, uh, evolution does occur. So if it meets the Hardy-Weinberg principles, then it is not evolving. Basically what he, said, what he wanted to do is he wanted to explain evolution in a textbook type. We can calculate it. Okay. 
It didn't work out like that. He has a formula in everything. It's called the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And he's saying that we can, we can predict how many of your offspring will have this and this. You can, we can calculate the probability, but we can't actually say for sure we will see that. So we, bottom line said, this is a theoretical reference. This is a theory. Here are the conditions to meet Hardy-Weinberg. There can be absolutely no mutations that occur. If anybody mutates, you're evolving. The population is closed to migration. So nobody comes in, nobody goes out. Y'all are stuck. That's not a thing. The second, or the third I meant, is that the population is infinite in size. So if it's infinite in size, how do we control no going or coming? Okay? All genotypes are free of selection. So whether you're weak or strong, you survive. Whether you're weak or strong, you survive. And it's random mating. Everybody's having babies with everybody. This is an unsafe situation. Okay, unsafe. If your population meets all five of these criteria, they are not evolving. I don't know that any population that I am familiar with could meet one of these criteria. Okay, the random mating may be a thing for certain species, but not all genotypes will be free of selection. Some of you are going to be weak, and what's going to happen as a result? You're going to die. You're going to expire. You're going to, you're going to get wiped out. So these are the five conditions that, if met, it shows that the population is not evolving. If one of those conditions is not met, the population is evolving. Okay? These are talking about um, agents of microevolutionary change, and I'm going to touch on them briefly, <laughs> but they're all defined here. A mutation, you already know it's a random change in genetic material, and the reason it's in genetic material is so that it can be passed on to the kids. Gene flow. Gene flow says that we have two separate populations, and you need to know these terms. That's why I'm spending the time explaining them. Gene flow says you have two separate populations that are divided for whatever reason. And somebody from this population gets a little curious, and they come over to this population, and they like it better. So the genes that were unique to this population have now flown over to this one, okay? So that's explained there. Genetic drift happens within a population. Genetic drift happens within a population, and there are countless examples of these. So when I would study it, I would figure it out, but mice are a good one for genetic drift. But what we see is that over time, the population may have started off with one coat color, but as the environment changed, it drifted to a, another coat color that was more selected for. Okay? So genetic drift happens within that population. You already know what natural selection is. You either adapt or die, you survive long enough to reproduce. And non-random mating means that you choose who you mate with. You don't say, I'm going to have a kid with herpes girl. You don't say that. That's random mating. You say, I don't want to have a child with that young lady. That's not who I want to have my child's mother or whatever. You, you choose your mates best based on their characteristics. Okay? If you want tall, athletic kids, then you meet and marry someone who has tall, athletic qualities so that they can be passed on. So it goes in and talks about each of these. Okay, so it's redundant as far as defining those. I once again, <laughs> mutations are a random change, but all these mutations don't have to be beneficial. If they are bad, what will happen to that organism? It will be selected against, it will expire. Okay? <clears throat> this is still talking about, what if you have a neutral mutation? What does that mean? 
It, it does not affect you in any way. It doesn't affect your chances of survival. Can you pass that on to your offspring? Yes. And is it going to impact them? It's neutral. And of course, if it's an advantageous mutation, it's going to benefit you. And as a result, you'll survive long enough to reproduce and you will do what with that mutation? Pass it on to your offspring. And hopefully we start to see that that becomes an adaptation leading to evolution. Okay. Gene flow, you have two separate um, populations and one crosses over. There are so many examples of this. It talks about different species of deer. It talks about different species of flowers because, you know, pollen is plant sperm. And when the wind blows hard enough, the plant sperm from this population could land on the females of this population. And now we have gene flow. So gene flow is between populations. Genetic drift is within a population. This could be just a natural situation, like I talked about the fact that the mice in their fur coats, but it could be a result of a, a crazy elimination of a population. What would be an example that may wipe out a population really quick, or large numbers of the population really quick? A fire, a fire fire. <laughs> a forest fire, a volcano, a flood, a virus. It could be a lot of things that could wipe out a large portion of the population and only a few survive. The good thing is, is that few survive. The bad thing is, is we went from having a lot of choices of parents to a small choice. And so whatever genes that these parents have, guess what? Those are the ones that are getting passed on. Okay? And we call that the bottleneck effect. We have a reduction in the number of alleles because there's only a few parents passing on as a result of whatever got us to be that smaller population. There's also the founder effect. Founder effect has a many different origins and explanations. This is the way I'm going to explain it to you, but let's say that you and I are a huge population, and we all really like everything that's going on, we're happy, this is fine, but we have this small group of people who you just can't please. And they say, you know what, we've had it with y'all, we're going to go start our own population. But there's only four of them. The benefit is that they don't have to follow our rules and they're happy that they're free. The drawback is, is that as they go to reproduce, they're only limited to what genes they have. And that's what we call the founder effect. So we find this sometimes occurring because individuals want to separate themselves. We find this also occurring because individuals get lost. Like they're traveling together and they get lost and they can't make their way back and so they just continue on in their life. So you never, you never know, but a new population is started as a result of just a few individuals. So the gene pool is very limited. Okay, so this is talking about the elephant seals and how we have a bottleneck effect. Their issue is that they're being overhunted. And so we have just a few that are making it to reproductive ages and as a result, we have just a, a really weak gene pool for those offspring. Do you remember what fitness is? How do we, when you're biologically fit, fit what does that mean? Yeah, you're, you survive long enough to reproduce. Fitness could have many different characters. It could be muscle, yeah, you're strong and you can fight somebody for food. But it could also be intelligence, that you're able to outthink someone. Okay, it could also be that you're a strategist. It could also be that you're resourceful. Fitness doesn't necessarily mean you have to be big, bulky, and muscular. You could be a manipulator and be fit because what can I do? You might be stronger and smarter than me, but I can trick you into giving me your food, and as a result, I've survived long enough to reproduce. How do I measure your level of fitness? How many kids you have? You're fit if you can survive long enough to reproduce. I measure your level of fitness by the number of kids you have. And that's really hard to hear as a human because you're like, well, I only want one. You're technically not that fit, okay? But we're not all 21 kids and counting, right? That's a really fit couple. So we could use like rabbits or dogs or cats to talk about when we talk about fitness. They have a whole bunch of offspring, but why do they have so many offspring? A lot of them are going to get picked off. And they aren't going to survive long enough to reproduce. So if I want my genes to survive, and I know a lot of them are going to die, I need to have 20 kids. But what do humans do to their kids to prevent that? We protect them. And we actually parent our kids a lot longer. The only organism that parents longer than us is the elephant.
So we might have some control issues. I don't know. Okay, so it talks about that. Sexual selection. Sexual selection, basically, for the majority of organisms, and this doesn't occur for everyone because we have asexual reproductive organisms, but it says that we have sexual, it actually leads to sexual dimorphism. Sexual dimorphism say that males and females are different. And there are characteristics that organisms look for, like certain females look for certain characteristics in males and vice versa. We tend to see that in general, and this is a very general statement, that in some species males are much larger than females and more colorful than females, but we see the exact opposite. But I don't know if you are familiar with crayfish, but the women are huge and the men are really tiny. And in order for the male to claim his female, he has to jump on her back. And he has to be able to fight all the larger males who are going to come and try to, to take his female. Okay? It's crazy, but we see dimorphisms, which means our males are clearly different <clears throat> than our females. And that leads to sexual selection. We have intersexual selection, which is when we're trying to attract the opposite sex. So females attracting males and males attracting females. So if we're talking about birds, we could be in other organisms, colors, um, choreography, like dancing, the way somebody, that, like seahorses dance, a lot of fish have dances that they do, um, different types of walks or gates for like uh, tetrapods, like giraffes, like they walk a certain way, or rhinoceri, they're walking a certain way to attract their mate. Intrasexual selections say that these are a way that we can combat our same-sex rivals, like Females fighting off other females for a male, and males fighting off males for another male. Like, we're not, like, this is my guy, that's your guy. Like, this has never been your guy, okay? So how we're competing for those mates. And ultimately, that's, that's a figure of fitness. If you can't compete for a mate, guess what you're not going to do? You're not going to mate. You're not going to reproduce. So guess what? You've been selected against, Okay. Um, Non-random mating says that we choose who we're going to mate with. The best part of choosing who you're going to mate with is the increased chance that you don't inbreed. And inbreed means that you mate with someone who is of the same lineage as you, okay, um, within your family. People say all the time, well, I've heard, I've heard that if you inbreed over and over and over again, that you just become weaker, and what they're referencing is that their genome comes weaker, becomes weaker. What do I mean by genome? Their genes. So if you inbreed, that would be like staying within a family, what does your gene pool look like? Is it varied or pretty strict? It's very strict. So if there are weak genes in that pool, they're going to get propagated. They're going to get passed down. Because you have such a small group you're pulling from. The benefit of breeding with others outside of your family is that you have access to more genes. If you know you have a weak genome, like you know you're short and you want tall kids, what do you do? Yeah, you don't breed with your short brother. You go find, <laughs> you go find yourself a very tall, not short male that's not related to you. Okay, so that's what it's talking about. And you can see here, this increases the frequency of homozygotes and recessive phenotypes because you're stuck with just this small pool of individuals. All right, we still have to go into one more chapter, so I'm going to hit stop.